Ivan Ike. Um, I don't know if we can raise the House of Ice a little bit. I can see if anybody's leaving. <laughs> um, and I'm really happy to be here, and thank you, Rishima, and thank you, Mr. Deputy Prime Minister, for gracing us with your presence with that introduction. Excuse my voice. Um, I had a very strong voice until I was 42 years old. And then I got a disease called spasmodic dystonia, which makes my voice tremble. But the good news is that after I speak for a little bit of a while, either you won't notice it or it goes away. I'm not sure why, but it's, it's not painful. Um, and I'm really, really happy to be here. I've spent the last three days with my friend, my dear friend, Fred Smith, which has just been a joy, and with Joe Darvin, all of his uh, Grand Bahama Waterkeeper, and with Rashim Ahn. Uh, we've toured in a, we have the water the Waterkeeper Alliance, the umbrella group, for now is the biggest water protection group in the world, 342 waterkeepers, each one with patrol boats. We're in 44 countries, and we basically are a law enforcement organization. We make sure most of our nations have very good environmental laws that require government officials and corporate officials and polluters to obey the law. The problem is that those laws are rarely enforced. And one of the things that we do as water keepers is we go out and we make sure that the laws that are on the books actually do get enforced, and when there aren't good enough laws on the books, then we try to pass them. But the first water keepers were commercial fishermen. They're, we have them from every profession. We have on the west coast of North America, we have them on all the major rivers. A lot of them are surfers. We have a lot of lawyers. Um, we have some, um, a lot of former military people because it was started by a group of Marines on the Hutch River. We have an agronomist in Peru, and we have one supermodel, which is Rishima, here in the <laughs> uh, so We have everybody represented on um, all professions. Uh, and I'm going to talk, I, I'll just tell you something that we did yesterday, and then I'm going to tell you a little bit about how our group got started. But I want to kind of make that the same at this talk. We went, we got to spend the day diving in Bimini. In a beautiful, we did a shark dive. Actually, the, well, it was very exciting because one of the dive masters did get bit by a shark and did have to go to the hospital, but he was completely okay. It was very exciting for us. Um, <laughs> We gave him a huge tip, so <laughs> he said, if he knew he was going to get that tip, he would have gotten both hands done. <laughs> um, and uh, but yesterday, we went to tour the resort world, Capo's resort there, and I saw something that was just horrifying. It's a, uh, it was an area that was a pristine area of the Bahamas, a, a bay, there's 750 acres of mangroves that has been, they took the dredge oil from building the channel for these big new super cruisers. They took all that oil that made a mountain of land and then they created another island. But they created it in a flat that was a world famous bonefish flat. They buried, they buried five dive sites that were world class dive sites. They destroyed 14 dive sites. They, and we, we were given the tour by a, this very, very articulate and wonderful cab driver named Milton Cox. And he said, this is the place that we drove over in. He said, if I didn't get enough money to drive my taxi, I can come here right any day I want and get to lobster. Now it's gone. He said, there was a billion shrimp in this bay and nobody can catch shrimp anymore, but they were always reliable. This was the social safety net for our community. This is where we, if the economy went south, we could come here and we could feed ourselves, we could feed our families. If we don't have, if he talked talk about the places of the snapper, the nursery ground for the snapper, um, 
these beautiful, beautiful, pristine areas that have been completely plowed up over, and they're creating these little postage stamp blocks that look exactly like North Florida. And Milton said, you know, they don't even, they won't let taxis, they deliberately do not create a place for taxis to park here because they have their own tram that is run by their employees. I think they brought in 1,700, 2,000 employees from Central America, Mexico, the Mideast to build it. It's not Bahamians. Um, and none of that money is end up in Bimini, certainly, and very little in the Bahamas. We passed one house where he pulled in the driveway and said, this is the house of the minister who approved this resort. And I know from my years, I've seen this story again and again and again. I've been to the Privy Council where Fred went and almost won the case to prevent that from happening. But it was already too late or he would have won. But we went on one of my cases, it was the exact same case with Bailey's, where a foreign investor came in and it's just the, it's the old colonial model where a foreign company comes in with no ties to the community, bribes the local oligarch and public officials, yeah. and steals the public resources, publicly owned natural resources from that community, monetizes them, turns them into profit, profit, and then leaves the community with nothing behind. And I saw this happen in Bailey's with the Chilillo Dam project, which has now ruin that country financially. And, it, and the people in that country are now in debt for generations because of that project, which brought no benefits to the country, but enriched from half a billion dollars to foreign developers. And it, we, we see it in the United States all the time. Anytime that you see wide scale or, or large scale environmental injury of that kind of scale, you'll also see the subversion of democracy. You'll see the corruption of public officials, the capture of the agencies that are supposed to protect our nation and our people from environmental injury. They become those agencies become sock puppets for the for the, the industries that they're supposed to be regulating. You'll see the disappearance of the transparency in government, the lack of public participation, and the breaking of laws. And that becomes uh, as part of the project. And we see that again and again and again and again. The question is, how does a small nation like the Bahamas that does have a colonial legacy? And you know, this is happening in the United States. I see it in our communities being colonized. And I'll talk about that in a minute, but in a country like this, how do you put the safeguards into the government and regulatory schemes to make sure that there's public participation, to make sure that Crown Land, that is, you know, people came off the, Bimini is famous all over the world. It's famous for its bonefish, it's famous for its lobster, it's famous for the shrimp and the, the mangroves that feed the large pelagic species that never have to come near the shore. It's why the marlin are there, because of those mangroves. And you destroy them, you're killing the goose that, that laid the golden egg. And uh, to me, it's so sad to see. It's a tragedy. I know it's criminal. Something criminal happened there. Because something that was valuable to all the people of this island, of these islands, this nation for generations and generations has now been stolen and it's impossible to restore it. And, you know, I, this movement started up in the Hudson River in 1966. And it was started by a blue collar coalition of commercial and recreational fishermen who mobilized to reclaim the Hudson from its polluters. And I hope, kind of, in that story, there may be some kind of parables for a way that we might behave to reclaim our democracy here in the Bahamas and the Crown land that's being robbed from us systematically by outsiders and privatized and turned into these bubble communities 
when there's no intrusion and there's no penetration by Bahamian culture or Bahamian people or the Bahamian economy. And in 19, the Hudson River is the oldest commercial venture in North America. It's 350 years old. Many of the people that I represent, that I've represented for the last 35 years, came from families that have been fishing the river commercially since the Dutch colonial times. It's a traditional gear fishery. They use the same fishing methods that were taught by the Algonquin Indians to the original Dutch settlers in New Amsterdam and passed it on through the generations. It's a sustainable fishery. One of the enclaves on the Hudson River for the commercial fishery is a little village called Crotonville, New York. It's 30 miles north of New York City on the east bank of the river. And the people who lived there back in 1966 were not your kind of prototypical affluent environmentalists. They were factory workers, lathers, carpenters, electricians. Half the people in Crotonville made their living either fishing or grabbing the Hudson. These were people with little expectation that they'd ever see Yosemite or Yellowstone in the national parks. For them, the environment was their backyard. It was the bathing beaches, the swimming holes, the fishing holes in the Hudson. Richie Garrett, who was the first president of the Riverkeeper, used to say about the Hudson, it's our Riviera, it's our Monte Carlo. Richie Garrett was a grave digger from, from uh, Austin, in New York. He used to tell us, if followers, I'll be the last to let you down. But in 1966, Penn Central Railroad began vomiting oil from a four and a half foot pipe on the Groton Harmon Rail Yard. The oil went up the river on the ties, it blackened the beaches, it made a shad taste of diesel, so that they couldn't be sold in the full fish market in New York City. And all the people in Grotenville came together in the only public building in the town, actually a room of about a third of this size. And it was the it was the Parker Vale American Legion Hall. This is a very patriotic community. Grown by the highest mortality rate during World War II of any community in our country, virtually the entire male population joined the Marines the day after Pearl Harbor. The same thing happened during the Korean War. And almost all of the original founders, board members, and officers of Riverkeeper were former Marines that were combat veterans from World War II, from Vietnam, from Korea. These weren't radicals, they weren't militants, they were people whose patriotism was rooted in the bedrock of our country. But that night they started talking about violence because they saw something that they thought they owned, which was the abundance of these fisheries and that their parents had exploited for generations and the purity of the Hudson's waters. And those things were being robbed from them by large corporate entities over whom they had no control. And they had been to the government agencies that are supposed to protect Americans from pollution, to the Corps of Engineers, the Conservation Department, the Coast Guard, and they were given the bombs rush. Richie Garrett and another Marine, Richie Garrett was a combat veteran from Korea, and another veteran uh, named Art Glauca, who at that time was an Eastern Airlines pilot, made 20 separate visits to the Corps of Engineers office in Manhattan, begging the Corps colonel to do his job and shut down the Penn Central pipe. And he finally told them in exasperation, these are important people, speaking of the Penn Central Board of Directors. We can't treat them that way. In other words, we can't force them to comply with the law. So by this evening in March of 1966, Urging everybody in Crotonville had come to the conclusion that government was in cahoots with the polluters. And the only way that they were going to reclaim the river for themselves is if they confronted the polluters directly. And somebody suggested that they put a match to the oil stick coming out of the Penn Central pipe and burn up the pipe. Somebody else said that they should roll a mattress up it and jam it up the pipe and flood the rail yard with its own waste. Somebody else said they should float a raft of dynamite into the intake of the Indian Point power plant, which at that time was killing a million fish a day on its intake strings and taking food off their family tables. Then a guy stood up with another Korean War vet, he'd been an officer in Korea, and his name was Robert Boyle, and he was the outdoor editor of Sports Illustrated magazine. 
for 65 years. He had been, he had been, uh, he was also, he was a great fly fisherman and spin fisherman. He read half a dozen books on angling. And he was one of the gurus of dry fly tying in our country. Two years before, he had written an article about it, angling in the Hudson for Sports Illustrated. And in researching that article, he had come across an ancient navigational statute called the 1888 Rivers and Harbors Act. And that statute said that it was illegal to pollute any waterway in the United States. You had to pay a big penalty if you got caught. But also, there was a bounty provision that said that anybody who turned in the polluter got to keep half the fine. And he had sent a copy of that law over to the libel lawyers at Time Inc., which owns Sports Illustrated, and he said, is this still good law? And he sent him a memo back saying, in 80 years, it's never been enforced, but it's still on the books. And that evening, when all these men and women, the 300 people in the American Legion Hall, talking about violence, he stood up in front of them with a copy of the law and the memo, and he said, we shouldn't be talking about breaking the law. We should be talking about enforcing it. And they resolved that evening that they were going to start a group that was then called the Hudson River Fishermen's Association and later became Riverkeeper. They were going to go out and track down and prosecute every pollutant on the Hudson. Eighteen months later, they collect the first bounty in the United States history under this 19th century statute. They shut down the Penn Central Pipe for good. They got to keep $2,000, which was a huge amount of money in Crotonville, New York, in 1968, for two weeks of wild celebration in the town. <laughs> and they used the money that was left over to go after Steve Guy, the Tuck Tape, Standard Brand, American Science, the biggest corporations in America, and winning. In 1973, they collected the highest penalty in United States history against a corporate polluter that got $200,000 from Anaconda Wire and Cable for dumping toxics in Hastings, New York. They used that money to construct a boat, and they hired a full-time riverkeeper in 1983 uh, using bounty money, a guy called John Cronin, who had been a commercial fisherman on the Hudson. He used bounty money to hire me a year later as their first attorney, and since then we brought over 500 lawsuits, successful lawsuits, um, against Hudson River polluters. We forced polluters on the river to spend over five and a half billion dollars remediating the river. Wow. Today, as a result of our work, the Hudson River is an international model for ecosystem protection. This is a waterway that was a national joke in 1966. It was dead water. Um, for 20 mile stretches north of New York City and south of Albany, zero dissolved to oxygen. Today, it produces its richest waterway in the North Atlantic. It produces more pounds of fish per acre, more biomass per gallon than any other waterway in the ocean north of the equator. And it's the last major river system left in the North Atlantic. It's still in Alpha in the Mediterranean, and the Aegean, and the Adriatic, and the Baltic, and the Dardanelles, and the Bosphorus, and all the rivers that flow into them. There's only one left that still has strong spawning stocks of all of its historical species of migratory fish. That's the Hudson. So Noah's Ark. <laughs> and the miraculous resurrection of the Hudson has inspired the creation of these water keepers all over the world now in 44 countries. We have 342, as I said, and there's none that I'm prouder of than the, than the water keeper in the Bahamas. And I want to thank Fred and Rashima and Joe Darville for making us look so good in this country and for being relentless and for caring about democracy and for holding public officials and corporate officials to task. To, to serve the people, to serve democracy, and to protect crown land. And you know, one of the one of the themes that unites you know, all the water keepers is, and this is something I think every Bahamian should understand. And it's important in the United States, but in all, particularly the British colonies, that um, if we own the waterways. This is what the law says. That every, here's what the law says. Everybody has a right to use crown land, crown assets. Nobody can use it in a way that will diminish or injure 
is used in enjoyment by others. That, in the Constitution of every state in the United States, the, it says that the waterways of the states, the rivers and streams, and the fisheries in them are owned by the people. Whether you're rich or poor, or humble or noble, black or white, you have an absolute right to go down to that waterway and feed your family with the security you're not poisoning somebody, and with the knowledge that that fish is going to be there. Everybody can take their share, and nobody can take something even more than their share. This is an ancient law. It goes back to Roman times. It was called the code in the Code of Justinian. It was called the Public Trust Doctrine, and under that, that was one of the first efforts of constitutional government. What the Code of Justinian said is that those things that cannot are not susceptible to private property ownership: the air, the water. The wildlife, the fisheries, the public lands. It even protected aquifers, and they had publicly owned forests, and were, which were the kind of an analogy of crown land. And they said the law was that if you were a citizen of Rome, you had an absolute right to cross a beach, throw in a net, and take out your share of the fish. The emperor himself couldn't stop you. But the first thing that happens. When tyranny begins eroding and subverting democracy, our efforts by powerful private interests to privatize the public trust assets and to turn them into private profit. So when Roman law broke down during the Dark Ages, beginning with in 375 um, AD, the burning of the Library of Alexandria and the deterioration of Roman law across the empire, in every jurisdiction in Europe, local kings and feudal lords began reasserting control over private pro public trust assets or selling them to powerful private interests. For example, in England, King John said that the fish, that the, the, uh, the game animals like the deer and the rabbit and the hare which were once the social safety nets of that society. If, you're, if you were a farmer and your crop didn't come in, you could go into the forest, you could kill a rat and feed your family. King John said that those animals no longer belong to the people. They now belong only to the royalty and to the aristocracy. That's what got him in trouble with Robin Hood. <laughs> he also privatized the fish of England. So the salmon fisheries and the other freshwater fisheries, again, which were a social safety net. If you lost your job, you were hungry, you could go catch a fish. Anybody could do it. Suddenly, he said, no, those fish belong to the aristocracy. If you want to catch them, you have to pay a royalty to them. And you also erect navigational tolls on the Thames and the other rivers of England so that what, what was once free was going up, on, up and down the river for commerce or to visit relatives or whatever. You now had to pay tolls going up and coming down. This caused a revolution in England. The public rose up, led by the barons. They confronted King John on the fields of Runningmead, and they forced him to sign the Magna Carta. The full title of the Magna Carta is Magna Carta and Charter of the Forest. And Magna Carta was the source of all of my Bill of Rights as an American citizen, including ones we don't have anymore, like Hades Corpus. <laughs> but it also, um, it, it also included protections of free access to the waterways so that you can't block a population in the inland, which is happening all over the Caribbean, and nobody can block you off from access to a waterway. This was a basic natural law right, what people considered God-given right. And, you know, you can't have a hotel come and say, the public can't access this beach anymore, the public can't access this reef anymore. And we're seeing that here, but all over the Caribbean, where those publicly you know, owned assets are being fenced off from the public. And when we had the revolution in this country, those rights from the Magna Carta descended to the people of the States. And I'll tell you, you know, how powerful this is and how serious they were about it. In the 16th century, or 17th century, um, they passed a Clean Air Act in England. 
and it forbade the burning of coal in stoves in London because the air was owned by the people and you weren't allowed to contaminate it. And it was a capital offense and people were killed for it. People were, were hanged for polluting the air. So it was a real right, it was recognized as a real right, and when we had the revolution in our country, all those rights descended the people to the states and their body in the state constitutions of all our states. What happened in our country is the same thing that happened here. Corporations and powerful entities and interests began infiltrating the political system. And they began changing the laws and changing interpretations of the law. In the United States in 1847, the law in every jurisdiction in our country was that if a factory was burning, was emitting smoke, the smoke got onto my property, my, I'm the neighbor, as well as one day a year, I had an absolute right to close it in that factory. So this was something that was intolerable to, uh, for a lot of interest, and those laws were changed, and we went completely, the pendulum swung very far in the other direction. And when I was growing up, before Earth Day, I saw the legacy of that. I know Rachel Carson wrote her book, which was the first thing to disclose it and say, where she said, the poisons that we consider miracles are actually killing us. They're killing everything that we value. And they're, they are impoverishing us, impoverishing us and they're impoverishing the environment. And, and I remember, in, when I was growing, when I was a boy, I remember in 1969, the day after my dad was, the year after my dad was killed, and like year he was declared dead. There was no law to dissolve oxygen, and I couldn't swim in the Hudson of the Charles of the Potomac growing up. I remember what the air smelled like in Washington, D.C., and, you know, there was particulates in the air. We had tens of thousands of Americans dying every year during smog events. The Cuyahoga River burned that same year with flames that were eight stories high and couldn't be put out for a week. The Eastern and Adams Peregrine Falcon, most spectacular predatory bird in North America. When, when I was a little boy, I was intensely interested in hawks, and I would, there was a pair of them nesting on the old post office building in Washington, D.C., and when I went to visit my uncle in the White House, we went two or three days a week, this is my father at the Justice Department, and I would always look at these birds, and I could see them coming down Pennsylvania Avenue. They could fly 240 miles an hour, and picking pigeons out of the air 40 feet above the heads of pedestrians. And to me, that was much more exciting than visiting my own little White House. <laughs> <laughs> that bird went extinct in 1963 from DDT poisoning. And this accumulation of insults, in 1970, drove 20 million Americans out onto the street. 10% of our population, the largest public demonstration in American history, demanding that our political leaders return to the American people the ancient environmental rights that had been stolen from our citizens over the previous 80 years. The political system responded. Republicans and Democrats were terrified of this democratic outpouring. And they passed, over the next 10 years, 28 major environmental laws, including transparency laws, like the Freedom of Information Act and, the, and you know, uh, permanent approval actions that require uh, public input. And they democratized it. And they weren't creating new laws. They were simply restoring the ancient laws that had always been recognized. That you, can't, you can use your property any way you see fit. But you cannot use it in a way that will injure your neighbor's property or diminish his quality of life. You do not own that right. It's not one of the bundle of property rights that come with that piece of property. And, you know, we understand, all of us, the people I work for were commercial fishermen. They made their living on the waterway. They didn't want to exclude people from the water. They wanted people to use the water. And they understood we're not protecting the water for the sake of the fishes and the birds, we're protecting it for our own sake. Because we recognize that nature is the infrastructure of our community. And that if we want to meet our obligation as a generation, a civilization, as a nation, which is to create communities for our children, 
that provide them with the same opportunities for dignity and enrichment and prosperity and good health as the communities that our parents gave us. We've got to start by protecting our environmental infrastructure, the air we breathe, the water we drink, the wildlife, the fisheries, the public lands in this nation, the coral reefs and the beaches that call the entire world to the Bahamas and that, you know, that fill people's pockets here in these communities and not you know, build isolated communities on top of those resources that are no benefit to the people of the Bahamas and to steal that land from them permanently. And, you know, there's also, you'll often, if you turn Fox News, I don't know if you get it down here, but you'll see, you know, all these um, polluters and big polluters and their indentured servants in Washington, these is and elsewhere. <laughs> And uh, we, uh, you know, we have to choose between economic prosperity on the one hand and environmental protection on the other. And that is a false choice. In 100% of the situations, good environmental policy is identical to good economic policy. If we want to measure our economy, and this is how we ought to be measuring it, based upon how it produces jobs and the dignity of jobs over the generation, over the long term, and how it preserves the value of the assets of our community. If, on the other hand, we want to do what, you know, the big shots, what Capo, you know, wants us to do, and the other guys who are trying to privatize, which is to treat the Bahamas as if it were business and liquidation, convert your natural resources to cash as quickly as possible, have a few years of pollution-based prosperity, you can generate an instantaneous cash flow and the illusion of a prosperous economy, but your children are going to pay for your joyride, and they're going to pay for it with the new lot of the land and poison the great environments that they will, they will never be cleaned up, and nobody will be able to afford to. If environmental injury is deficit spending, it's a way of lowering the cost of our generation's prosperity onto the backs of our children. And one of the things that I've done over the past 35 years as an advocate is to constantly go around and confront this argument that an investment in our environment is a diminishment of our nation's wealth. It doesn't diminish our wealth. It's an investment in infrastructure. The same as investing in telecommunications or road construction is an investment that we have to make if we're going to ensure the economic vitality of our generation and future generations. And, you know, I, listen, I'm not a radical. I believe in free market capitalism. In fact, people for 30 years are saying, what was the best environmental law you'd like to see passed? I've always said the same thing. I would like true free market capitalism because in a true free market, a true free market promotes efficiency, and efficiency means the elimination of waste. Pollution is waste. In a true free market, we would have to properly value our natural resources, like those bonefish habitats and those mangroves. And it is the undervaluation of those resources that causes us to use them wastefully. In a true free market, you can't make yourself rich without making your neighbors rich and without enriching your community. What polluters do is they make themselves rich by making everybody else poor. They raise standards of living for themselves by lowering quality of life for everybody else. And they do that by escaping the discipline of the free You show me a polluter, I'll show you a subsidy. I'll show you a fact hat using political clout to escape the discipline of the free market and force the public to pay his production costs. And all the people of Bimini and all the people of Bahamas are going to be paying for that resort forever. And it brings nothing to them except deficit debt and the end of a social safety net that provided livelihoods and a living to people of Bimini from the beginning of, of time. And it's gone. Those people literally stole it. They privatized it. And you know they gave somebody money because nobody in their right mind would approve that Unless they got a payoff. It's just.
up our democracy. And I, I say one other thing. Um, and then I'm just shut up. <laughs> no one asked you to. Okay. You know, I talked about the economic cost of that, of what they did there. And, and the legal cost, you know, the disgrace to the system of democracy in the Bahamas. That a foreign developer could come in there and somebody would allow them to come in and steal that from the poor and the rich and all the people of the Bahamas. That's a World Heritage Site. That place was, you know, I've been reading about it in Hemingway in the islands of the sea, which I, you know, I read when I was a little boy. And I read about the paradise that Adam Clayton Powell used to go to, where Martin Luther King went to write. It is most famous speech, the, you know, the I Have a Dream speech. They did it on those beaches because of the inspiration. Because, they, because people went there for something spiritual that they couldn't get anywhere else. It is why they come here to the Bahamas. And you can sense it everywhere that you go here. We were sitting out on Fred's porch last night and watching that full moon rise with the palm trees going in front of it and the waves hitting the beaches. And, you know, you feel something here that people all over the world want to feel. That's why we have City Park. We have City Park. In America, you know, our most famous historian, Frederick Jackson Turner, said in America, democracy came out of the forest. Without you know these vast tracts of wilderness or woodland, we wouldn't have developed the political institutions that, that we did in this country, and and that's what, and people understood that you know there was a time in our history, right after the, the British you know our revolution with the British when Americans were saying, well now who are we? Because we used to be you know Brit we used to be British. Used to be Europeans, but now we're not Europeans. We've cut the umbilical cord. What does it mean to be American? What does that mean? And you know, at first they said, "Well, we're we're kind of a new democracy, so we're like the Greeks." So they built, they named their cities Metropolis and Annapolis, and you know, and um, and Athens, and and uh, and they built. All of the government buildings were built with ionic and Doric columns and mimic the Greek. But at the same time, you had this group of the greatest American philosophers, including the biologists Agassiz and Emerson and Thoreau and, um, and, a, and the great artists uh, from the Hudson River School, Phillips, who uh, all got together in a camp called the Adirondack Camp. And they got together and they to try to define who we were as a people. And they said, it's, they said, you don't have to be ashamed. Americans don't have to be ashamed. That we don't have the 1,500 years of culture that they have in Europe. Because we have this relationship to the land, and particularly wilderness, which is the undiluted work of the Creator. And that's going to be the source of our values and our virtues and our character as a people. And out of that meeting came the Hudson River School of Art, Thomas Cole, Federal Church, Samuel F. B. Morris, Gears, Pat Cropsey, who came down here to the Bahamas to paint the waves. When Thomas Cole went back, you know, back in those days at movie theaters, and these artists would go paint foreign lands like the Bahamas, and then they would go back and show them in England. And I read the reviews that Thomas Cole got back where they said, the waves are ridiculous. There's no way they could be that color. They look like cotton candy. <laughs> what they do? That's, if you look at them, they're exactly how they look. And you know, they were showing the world that. And in America, they painted these vast, indomitable landscapes like Yosemite and El Capitan and the Grand Canyon. And and, and where anything human built was kind of ant-like and in ruins. And their message was that our power is more than yours because it comes directly from the Creator. And it comes from the from creation and this wilderness. And that's going to be the source of our virtues as a nation. And here you have it all around you like nobody in the world does. 
And yet there are people who, you know, who will sell that for cash to make themselves rich and then, you know, or trade maybe to get a home in that little exclusive gated community where Bahamians aren't allowed and not welcome. And um, it's not an accident. Uh, it, it's not just cultural. You know, this is a part of Bahamian culture. It's not an accident that this is that in every religious tradition, in the history of mankind, in every major religious tradition, the central epiphany always occurs in the wilderness. Buddha had to go sit up under the Bodhigaya tree in the wilderness in India in order to have his transcendent revelation and experience nirvana. Muhammad had to go over the wilderness of Mount Hera. He was a city boy from Mecca. He went on a camping trip with his family and slept in a cave and wrestled in the angel Gabriel there and had the first surahs of the Quran speech from him. Moses had to go to the wilderness of Mount Sinai to talk to God, to get the commandments, to see the burning bush alone. Christ had to go into the wilderness of 40 days to discover his divinity for the first time. His mentor was John the Baptist, who lived in a cave in the wilderness and ate locusts, the honey, of wild bees. And all of Christ's parables are taken from nature. I am the vine, you are the branches, the mustard seed, the little swallows, the scattering of the seeds on the fallow ground. Because he recognized that as the currency of wisdom. That, you know, God talks to us, as St. Augustine said, in many, many voices. Um, God talks about that every leaf of every tree it is a text. That the valley book, the songs of the birds, are words. And Augustine said, all of those things, every species is a vast tapestry that's sewn together to tell us something. And that when we destroy those things, we're taking yarn out of that tapestry and it's fraying and weakening, and our children are being deprived of their capacity to imagine, of their capacity to, to vocalize, of their capacity to experience this richness. God talks to human beings through many factors, through each other, through organized religions, through the great books of those religions, through prophets, wise people, through art and literature and music, but nowhere with such texture and richness and grace and joy as through creation. And when we destroy those things, we're not only committing a crime, like that capital development, which is a crime, but it's also a sin. It's an insult and an injury to our children and to others. And, you know, we need to take control of our governments, and we need to tell our public officials we're not going to tolerate that, and we are going to take our obligation to our children seriously and to future generations. And when somebody you know, does something like that, it's an act of theft. They're stealing from all of us, and they're stealing from our children. And they ought to be exposed and investigated and punished and treated as thieves because they committed a crime, and that is a crime against the Bahamian people. Oh, I, um, I'm, I'm, I'm just happy that I got to experience some of the things that Fred and Rashima and Joe introduced me to here since I came to the Bahamas on this trip. I've come down here many, many times. I love this country. I love these islands. And I hope that you, the people who live here, will honor them and understand what a, what what you lucky people you are to be able to experience this extraordinary it is you know fred said to me last night and in my wife he said why would you want to go to heaven when you can live here you know, and, and we are what yeah what how could it ever be better than this and nobody's going to make it better with a bulldozer i can guarantee that and on that time, Milton Cox was such a joy and such a treasure because he understood everything that I just said. He said it 20 times better. I wish I had a recording of him. 
Uh, he said, yeah, they put a fence up to make sure no Bahamians could come in here. And some friends of mine, I'm not going to say who, but knocked it down with the D8 Caterpillar. And um, I'm like, yeah, that's what we got to do. We have to take this thing back. And um, I want to thank all of you for, there's a lot of things that all of you could be doing on Easter Sunday. I've been coming out, listening to an environmentalist, um, prattle on about your own you know, backyard. I want to thank you for caring enough to come out here. And I hope you'll share my indignation and outrage and your commitment, my commitment doing anything I can for the Bahamian people to make sure that something like that never happens again. Thank you all. It's not your obligation to give the vote of thanks. It's fine. Come, come, stand, come stand by me. You know, we, we have the privilege of going to the uh, International Waterkeeper Alliance uh, usually every year. And we sit mesmerized by him because he gives the keynote address at the end of every conference. And it's just amazing. The man has a memory that's absolutely phenomenal. So many details that we shared with him over the last number of days, including the visit to Bimini and elsewhere, he, he regurgitated it tonight like it was just part of his uh, brain power in there and still from a long time ago. And that's the type of person uh, Bobby Kennedy Jr. is. He is absolutely phenomenal. And I think the inspiration, well, we started uh, Water Keepers and actually uh, the um, uh, Save the Days of Water Keepers before we even knew Bobby, because it was after we were established uh, that we were able to participate in the conference every year. And uh, so we have accelerated our enthusiasm and our passion for Mother Earth. And Bobby, there is so much. I mean, just sitting under a tree. And Rishima has, has surprised me for a second time. That, uh, that piece that I wrote under uh, my breadfruit tree, she surprised me by performing that with her reciting it and, dan and a dance group a couple of years ago. And then tonight when I looked at the program, because I hadn't seen the program before now, there it was again in that beautiful rendition, The Tree. And I think you should get a copy of that because all of the stuff that Bobby has been saying tonight, the connection that we have, the soul of Mother Earth and the value of every iota and the connection that we have with her is absolutely phenomenal. And once, once we are in tune with that, then actually time and space flow through us. We're not rushed into time and space. And therefore we stay eternally young and vibrant and be able to appreciate everything so that, you know, we recite that all the time, that, you know, I don't know why I want to go to heaven when I have heaven right here on earth. And the fact is that Christ is saying, thy kingdom come on earth as it is in heaven. Bobby, uh, I, I don't know how to thank you for this invaluable presentation tonight, and we've enjoyed you so much in your uh, blessing us with your energy, your presence, your humility, but yet your power of words. And I think we, we, Rishima, Fred, you mention us a lot, but we're hoping that we could expand this group so that all of us can fight for the things that Fred, Rishima, and myself, and others that work with us, our facilitators in our youth environmental program, and our cadets. Those were the cadets, those are the darlings of Rishima, the ones beating the drum tonight, and, and those beautiful dancers, Matthew Wild Goose, that phenomenal artist over there. He's painting, he's uh, painting, uh, painting a, a species that is under threat in our waters. And we could solve that. In fact, we have begun to so, uh, solve it to a very great extent by having a closed season on our grouper, like we have on um, our lobster. And hopefully we'll have that on the conch. Now, Bob, 
Bobby been reading all this stuff about ain't no conch in the Bahamas no more. And then, so when I told him the other night I was going to make some curry conch for I get together, he said, curry conch, but ain't no more conchs in the Bahamas. I said, yeah, Bobby, we still have plenty, plenty conchs, but we want to make sure that they are here for future generations. But I want to, I, I, well, maybe anyone has a burning question for Bobby because, you know, he's opened up our hearts, our consciousness, our awareness, our passion so much. We, we can entertain a couple questions for him, please. Anyone? Uh, yes, uh, I, I wrote a book several years ago called River Keeper that has a lot of that stuff and a lot of the spiritual stuff um, and that kind of history and it and some really beautiful uh, mandates, biblical mandates that um, I was thinking about before I came in here when I, when I was sitting in the back and thinking about what I was going to say. I wish I could remember them, and I wish I had a copy of that book. But anyway, it's called The River Keepers. I have a book that came out this year um, that talks about a lot of those things in a different way, which is called American Values, and it's kind of a, um, an autobiography um, about my dad and, and myself. But anyway, The River Keepers it has a lot of that stuff in it. Thanks for asking. Uh, yes, how you doing, sir? I, you, you, you made mention of the Crown Land aspect, and I knew very similarly in the United States before, I guess, I think it's the Department of Interior take, took over, uh, where you have these particular assets, because we, our Crown Land asset still resides in the office of what we call the Prime Minister here in the Bahamas. What would be your, your recommendation in regards to what we could do to separate that environment where the exclusivity of the decision lies in a single individual or a group of people. Well, I, I don't think that um, there is, a, a, you know, the, the, the prime minister ought to be able to govern the country. Uh, in our country, when you're disposing of public property, you have to do, it has to be, everything has to be done in the open. You have to do an environmental impact statement up front that discloses everything, and then there are there have to be hearings. And basically, the rule is, if you're going to change the use of a crown asset, and it, and there's nothing about there's nothing wrong with developing it, but you have to demonstrate that it is going to that the benefits are going to accrue to the entire community. So you can't take something, you know, a capital asset from the community, you can transform its use, you can put a dam in a river, but you have to show that all the public is going to benefit from that dam. So um, in this case, I don't think it would have passed the smell test. You know, it, it, the, I, the, the way that they were able to get rid of that, to do, to get away with that scandalous criminal act, is that everything was done in secret. And, you know, all the deals were made in secret. And I just, I know from seeing, having seen hundreds of these, um, that something got paid off, because nobody would have allowed that. Nobody, you know, nobody hates the Bahamas. Whoever did that hates the Bahamas, and or they got a lot of money. So I don't think anybody in government hates the Bahamas. I think somebody got paid off. And we saw houses owned by at least one of the ministers in that development who was the decision maker in that. Um, in that. So, you know, that's suspicious. That should be investigated. I think Fred has a, um, Fred actually talked to me today about a law that's, at, that's being proposed now to do exactly that. Fred, why don't you, I said you have a microphone. Well, yeah, before you answer, just let me ask a question. You made the mention of the word community. Would you agree that the community itself is the entire Bahamas as opposed to 
a small sect of people in that particular area that they would be making a decision in? Yeah, but I, there's also, I, I, I also think that it's not, for something like that, it should be everybody, you know, if everybody has a stake in it, there may be somebody in that local community who have, whose stake should be weighted, you know, more, slightly more. And you have to figure out those formulas, and there's plenty of ways to do that using the law. That is a world heritage site. The whole world has an interest in that site, and the Bahamian people are stewards of that site. And, you know, to destroy, I mean, to me, the idea of destroying bonefish flats are, that, you know, I grew up hearing about bonefishing in the, in, in the Bahamas. It was like, you know, that was like the greatest thing that you could do as a sports person. To go bonefishing in the Bahamas, and when I was driving over a pile of rubble on top of the former bonefish flat, I was like, who in the world could ever commit this crime? What kind of person could do it? Anyway, let me tell you who could do it. <laughs> well, good evening, ladies and gentlemen. First of all, Mr. Kennedy, I'm not going to be the vote of thanks, but thank you very much for joining us tonight. And uh, another one of our directors, Gail Woon, is here. Directors, Gail Woon is here. And we have so many friends and supporters of Save the Bays and the Waterkeeper Alliance. I'd like to thank the Deputy Prime Minister, uh, my Member of Parliament, uh, in my constituency, for being here tonight and uh, gracing us with some kind words and uh, indicating the government's commitment to the environment. Um, I'd like just to follow on from what Bobby said about Bimini, because it is a real crime that has been committed to the community of Porgy Bay and Allistown and South Bimini. Because you have, all of you have heard me speak about how anchor projects, these heads of agreements, they are like a, an AIDS virus to the body politic of the Bahamas. Because creating these bubbles of foreign investment that are exclusive to the developer and to incoming uh, homeowners is not beneficial to the Bahamas. And Bimini is the epitome of that kind of abuse because you go through the gates and it's like Disney World. And there are curbs and there are sidewalks and there's beautiful landscaping and there's a casino there and there are beautiful condominiums and houses being built. And there's a walkway, I walked all the way up along there. No Bahamians were walking up and down that. Now I have nothing against foreigners, I have nothing against developers. I promote development. I too am a capitalist. I too want developers here. So Save the Bays is not against development. I'd like to emphasize that. It's as Bobby said, it's the way that it's done. So that it doesn't steal the value of what belongs to us as locals. And so in Bimini, because we still don't have, and I beg the Deputy Prime Minister for the few years, and hopefully more that they will be there, to finally pass an Environmental Protection Act. Please, we want to let them know who we want it, please. And also to pass, well, we have passed it, and to bring into effect a Freedom of Information Act that will help all of us for transparency, for democracy. Because God forbid the FNM should lose the next election, and then the PLP come back in and do everything in secret again. Deputy Prime Minister, you won't be able to find out what they're doing. So pass the act before they come back in. So, please. So, ladies and gentlemen, anchor projects are a sin to the Bahamian uh, development landscape. Because you have no local government. All the casino taxes don't go into the community of Bimini. Sam Beauty doesn't go in there. Business license taxes don't go in there. They get crown land by digging up the dredge and creating all this new, these new islands, five or six new islands that they sell for five or six or ten million dollars for every little house they put in it. But you know, the old concept of having to get on bended knee, and I'll do it, get on bended knee and beg a developer to come in and give away our crown land 
Give away stamp duty. Give away VAT. Give, I don't think we do that anymore. Give away uh, business license taxes. No, he never gives up VAT. It's the VAT man. We just don't want him to increase it. That's all. <laughs> so, but we cannot have developments that are divorced from the community, like Bimini. And that is a real issue. That It's like... I don't want to call Bimini a slum because it isn't. But when you look at the difference in infrastructure and affluence, and how can all those foreigners come to Bimini and enjoy the northern part in Bimini World Resorts, and yet see that the medical facilities, you know, the educational facilities, the Biminites don't have good running water often, they have issues with power, etc. You can't allow developments to come in and to be invaders, sorry, yeah, they're invaders and not investors. Campbell is an invader of North Bimini. He's really not a community investor. Hmm. So yes, the Bahamians get to pick up the towels. They get to, you know, mow the lawn. They get to clean the, the, the rooms. They get to run a couple of taxis now and again. But one more thing they, do, they can't do because, and I'm glad my minister is here, because of exchange control laws, no Bahamian, everybody else in the world can own a piece of the you know, of, of Carnival or RCCL or Atlantis or Hutchison. All the big developments that happen in the Bahamas by publicly traded companies. Everybody else in the world can get profits and dividends from them, but not one Bahamian can. So if there's something you can do, Minister of Finance, please, is to find a way to allow Bahamians to participate in the profits that all the publicly traded companies make. That's why they come to the Bahamas. They make so much money, they love it here. We'd like to participate in it too. But we have to have, when investors come, they need to become part of the community. We need to increase the educational facilities increase the public infrastructure, increase the health facilities, increase the opportunities for the police, the ambulance, everybody to have better services to provide to the community. We can't have separatisms like separatist communities like we have. So I've spoken too long, guys. You didn't come in. Oh, okay. Thank you very much. <laughs> I think we have time for one more burning question for Bobby, please. Yes. Go ahead. Thank you again for coming, Mr. Kennedy. Uh, as a member of the Grand Bahama Beekeepers Cooperative, we share your principles of environmentally safe capitalism. What are your suggestions for small organizations to prove that to the community, to prove that to the government, that environmentally responsible capitalism is the way forward? Uh-oh. Uh-oh. I, I mean, I, you know, my whole background is in, um, in grassroots organizing and trying to make government by hand. I don't think anything really is ever solved top down. It always is solved bottom up. And you're, you know, the, the, the waterkeeper movement began with a handful of, and of the 300 people who were in the room that night, I think probably only two of them had ever been to college. And most of them had never participated in voting before. And they suddenly realized that by not doing that, they were losing their rights. They were losing their livelihood. They were losing their property values. They were losing their health and things that they valued, and they had to organize. So, oh, you know, I, my message to you is you're doing the right thing and, you know, don't stop complaining and start organizing because that's the only way things are going to be. Thank you all.